according to the theory of evolution, the origin and development of the universe and all its systems can be explained solely on the basis of time, chance, and continuing processes. All living things have arisen from a single-celled organism. A second and opposing worldview is the concept of creation. According to the theory of creation, everything in the universe has come into being through the design, purpose, and deliberate acts of a supernatural creator. That means this creator created the universe, the earth, and all life on earth, including all types of plants and animals, as well as humans. On today's edition of Origins, we'll talk about evolution roadblocks Hello my friends, my name is Don Chapman and this is Origins. We're delighted that you've joined us today for this show. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science, we use it to validate the truth of creation. I have with me today Ralph Muncaster who is the author of a tremendous book called Dismantling Evolution, Building the Case for Intelligent Design. Ralph, it's good to have you here. Great to be here again. Thanks for joining us. Listen. Uh, you, you say here in my notes, I'm reading that uh, evolution's roadblocks are creation support. What do you mean by that? Well, first of all, as we've said before, we need to remember that life either occurred through natural random development, which we call evolution, or through design, which of course is by, uh, which we call creation. It can't be both. And, uh, if we can prove one, we know that the other one can't be true. I'm with you. If we can disprove one, we know that the other one must be true. These are the only two options. Only two options. And they are not compatible. One's true and one isn't. Right. And we, on one show, we talked about the fact that if we can show, as we did, that we can't even get to that very first cell of life, that means there must be a creator. But for this purposes of this show, we'll assume that somehow, miraculously, some, the impossible happened. Well, give them the first 10 yards. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, we also talked about on a previous show that disproving God is impossible. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, and I've used the, the illustration of sound, for example. Sound is, if we were to assume a whole planet that's a planet of deaf people, then, of course, no one would have the capability of hearing a sound. So how do we know the sound is, is even there? Well, we run, we have a, a number of arguments, we have hypotheses, we have to get to those that are valid, hopefully testable, that we can test the existence of sound through some other way, and then we have to get to some true conclusions that we draw from that in order to, to prove if it is in fact true. Now we can do that with God, by the way, in terms of, of evidences of God through 100% perfect prophecy, through what he has done in the lives of others and other such things, but we're not, that's not our topic for today. The purpose is to bring up the point that disproving God, we know, is impossible. And we know that because to disprove something like God, it's basically proving the absence of existence of God, which means in order to do that, we have to take every, God as a thing, so we would have to take everything and prove that it's not God, something that obviously we can't do. That makes sense. However, 
evolution is something that using human standards of proof, we talked about the fact that we can prove it to be impossible. Why? Because evolution is a process, a process that requires certain things to happen that because of modern science that we can now evaluate whether or not these are statistically possible. Could this process have taken place? Could it have taken place? Now, uh, you know, as, as little as seven to ten years ago, this would have been difficult. But now with modern biology, where we get into molecular bi biology, now that we have a limit on time of the age of the universe and the age of the earth, we can put limits on things. We can peer into cells and DNA, and we can look at the universe, and that leads us to some very interesting conclusions. And on one show, I went through this in great detail, where I basically showed that if we, if we took the very simplest cell, which would be a cell that had 100,000 nucleotides, which are the rungs of a ladder in a DNA molecule, and 10,000 amino acids, which scientists say these are minimum parameters. It probably was much greater than that. But let's take the, ver the bare minimum. We have such enormous odds against random development of these things happening that it's essentially impossible. The bottom line of all this is one chance, and by the way, this isn't everything, but these are some basic things, fundamental molecular biological processes that have to happen to randomly create that first cell. We find an enormous, uh, enormous odds against that happening. As a matter of fact, if trying to put that in perspective, because it's hard for most human beings to understand such a big number as that, it would be like picking a selected electron. If we exploded the entire universe, a billion stars in each of a billion galaxies, and then picking out one marked electron, it would be like doing that 1,376 times and being right every single time. It couldn't have happened. But for our show, we're going to assume that it did. We're going to assume it did. And I we're see. also going to assume the, another miracle, that somehow life could have been injected into this thing. Because you can't just have a dead cell. You have right. to have life in it, right? Okay. But we're so. going to give the evolutionists the first 20 yards and, and show that even if those two things, which are impossible, had happened, that this still couldn't work. That's where we're going to Yes. Be. Okay. The first problem that we, or the first roadblock, if you will, that we might encounter is something called irreducible complexity. What is irreducible complexity? This is the term that is given to a component of a system, like a human being, that is so complex that it requires many parts to come together at once for it to work. Now, one illustration, and this is, by the way, an idea that Michael Behe has done a great job in his book, Darwin's Black Box, of bringing to the forefront. And Behe explains a simple mousetrap, or you can, everybody knows what a mousetrap is. The problem is the mousetrap won't work unless all the parts come together at once. Think about it. What good would it be for a block of wood to evolve? Doesn't catch many mice or the spring mechanism to evolve, doesn't catch many mice, or the, the latch, none of it does you any good unless the whole mechanism comes together at once. Very simple explanation. But let's go to something far more complex. Let's look at the human eye. Human eye has these basic parts. Now this is just a small fraction of them. It talks about, you know, the vitreous humor, the aqueous humor, the lens, the pupil, the iris, the retina, the cornea, the muscles, the optic nerve. All of this had to come together at once. This is an enormous amount of stuff. And without any one of those things, the eye simply wouldn't work. Keep in mind, the brain had to know how to interpret the information as well. We have 7 million cones in our eye. We have 120 million rods in our eye. We have, the eye can differentiate millions of shades of color. The light, it's light sensitive to, to one or two uh, photons of light, which is a very small amount of light. So in one second, what can the eye do? Well, the eye can do in one second what it would take a Cray-2 supercomputer, that's like our biggest, most complex computer, what it would take hundreds of years to do. That's how complex our eye is, and it can do it all in one second. Wow. Now, 
the Ike just can't work by some gradual process. It didn't happen that way. There, ex, you know, there is no evolutionist explanation for how all these very highly complex parts came together and all started working at once with a brain that knew how to interpret the information. You know, Ralph, when we look at those two pictures, I'd just like to point out that if I said to our viewing audience that those computers there uh, beside you just evolved, that we had this little PC and we left it out overnight and it turned into that computer, people would laugh at us. Yes. But when we look at the eye, which is really more complex and does in a second what that could do in a hundred years, we believe somehow that that could have just evolved. And, and, and what we're saying is that if you're going to use the logic for the computer, you've got to use the same logic for the eye. Absolutely. Yeah, that makes good sense. Very, very good point. Let's talk about mutations. Now, evolutionists claim that mutations are the mechanism that causes something to go from a very, a very simplistic system to a very complex system. Mutations are destructive. Secondly, we find that mutations do not add information. We have no evidence where they add information. Now, if you're going to move from about 100,000 base pairs from the simplest bacterium to 3.2 billion base pairs in a highly complex system like a human being, obviously a, a tremendous amount of information needs to be added. Yet what we find is, in fact, uh, mutations don't add information. If anything, they take away information. So for mutations to build in a species, it's virtually impossible. Next, we get into statistics. People that have done statistics analyzing mutations, like Dr. Lee Spetner, for example, he's analyzed this problem with uh, developing a horse species from one to another. And he's done it in, in his book, uh, not by chance, he's done it using information provided by evolutionists themselves. Statistically, when you analyze that, you find that you cannot, you, that mutations are not capable of making something change from one species to another. But keep in mind, we're assuming uh, that we can have sufficient positive mutations and when in fact they are negative usually. And secondly, we're assuming they can add information when we don't have evidence of that. Now, we sh that shouldn't be so surprising. Think of it. If you're typing a report and your finger slips and you hit a different key, what are the odds that you're going to uh, hit a key that's going to improve your report? Not very good. I'd like it to happen, but so, it doesn't very so often. So basically, mutations usually make things worse and not better. Right. And secondly, they can never jump you from one species to another because they don't add information to the DNA chain. Correct. Okay, I'm with you. Okay, correct. Now, sometimes people come to me and they say, well, wait a minute now. Don't we have DDT-resistant pests? Isn't that ex an example of a mutational change right. that makes a better species? They don't understand the, the molecular biology behind it. What's happening is a deformity occurs with that mutation, which okay. takes away information, giving that pest other disadvantages. The DDT no longer can attach to the molecule. So yes, DDT becomes less effective. However, it has other advantages. Or take wheat, that human beings have learned how to make wheat with higher yields. Right. People say, well, wait a minute, is this a, an improved species? First of all, human beings did it. It was designed. It wasn't something that happened by random chance. But secondly, once we do that, we take away other things because, again, mutations don't add information. What it does now is wheat has to have certain fertilizer to survive, irrigation to survive. If all that was taken away, it would be less effective in the wild and would eventually go back to... But it, it, the other point is, it's, wheat is still wheat. That's right. And the pests are still pests, so they Wheat don't hasn't change. Become corn. That's right. It's just like the genes in your body, you have the capability of passing on uh, different eye color and different body traits to your offspring. That doesn't mean that your offspring is going to turn into a cow or something else, at least you would hope not. Uh, but it, what it does mean is that there's a lot of flexibility to adapt to different environmental right. uh, situations. Let's get into a physics dilemma. 
If we look at two laws of physics, the first law of thermodynamics, which implies that matter can neither be created nor destroyed, in general relativity that indicates that there was a beginning to, uh, in time, matter, and space. Now, both these can't be true. Either there was a beginning when, when matter was created, or it can't be uh, created or destroyed. So there's a dilemma in physics that can only be resolved with some supernatural creator. Now let's talk about the Bible. Is the Bible scientifically accurate? Well, you will find that the Bible talks about science in many different areas. In fact, I have a book on that. And you'll find that every single area, it predicted things thousands of years in advance. I'd like to talk about just creation. All right. If we go through creation, we will find 10 different steps of creation that agree identically with science. Now, I want to point out that the, the Bible is not a science textbook. Genesis 1 is not a science textbook. Every step of creation is not there. God is interested in what impacts mankind. But of the steps that are there, scientists agree with the ordering of those steps. Now let's talk about them very briefly. First we have the creation of the heavenly bodies we find in Genesis 1.1. All scientists would agree with that. And the earth is formless and void. Now this is important. There's a statement of initial conditions. The earth is formless and void. And secondly, a frame of reference. It says, and the Spirit of God is hovering over the surface of the deep or the waters, depending on your translation. So we've got a situation of an earth, we've got spirit of God hovering over the surface of the deep, and we have, scientists would agree, some kind of dark, very dark gases over that. Okay, so at that point, you wouldn't see any of the heavenly bodies that would be created. Second, it says, let there be light in Genesis 1-3. Over a period of time, this dark atmosphere becomes more translucent, and you can start to see some, some light starts to penetrate to the surface, which allows for photosynth photosynthesis. Step three, the development of the hydraulic cycle, which we find in Genesis 1-6, talking about this separation of waters and clouds. Step four, formation of land and sea, Genesis 1, 9, and 10, where it talks about seismic, essentially seismic activity that forms the continents. Step 5, the creation of vegetation, talks about in Genesis 1, 11. Now what happens when vegetation is sucking in carbon dioxide, what does it give off? It gives off oxygen. oxygen. Yeah. When it gives off oxygen, what does that do to the atmosphere? What it does, what it does is it makes the atmosphere transparent. Hmm. When it makes the atmosphere transparent, step six, you can then see the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon. And interestingly, and some people think, well, wait a minute, the sun and the moon were made on day four. If you get into the language very carefully, you find out it doesn't say specifically that they were actually created on day four. The word bara, Hebrew meaning to create out of nothing, is not used on day four. The Hebrew word asha is used, which means it could be, mean made to appear or it could mean a made that in a different tense. It's not certain that it was made on that day. But what we do know, the Bible gives us clues. It says to mark the days and the seasons, uh, and, and it gives us a purpose for why the atmosphere became transparent. And a scientist would say, of course it became transparent. There's more oxygen, and for other reasons, now we can see into the heavens, which we couldn't before. Step seven, we have creation of small sea animals. Genesis 124, step eight, creation of land animals. Step nine, creation of man. Step 10, very importantly, uh, no more creation. So all these steps follow what scientists would agree. So now, you're saying the order in Genesis 1 and the order of science is absolutely lined up uniform. It's in sync. People so what think, are the chances? Chances, <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> what are the odds that Moses would have guessed this right? And by the way, none of the ancients even knew the steps. Right. But if they did know the steps, what are the chances he could put them in the correct order randomly, just guessing? I'm going to guess one in four, bi four million. Hey, good guess. <laughs> That's almost the same as the chances of you winning the state lottery. That's how remote those chances are. Well, it, you know what? It sounds like he had some revelation to me. Ralph, we've got to take a break right now. And you, you don't go away, and you don't go away either. We'll be back real soon. Creation versus evolution. You weigh the evidence. Genesis or evolution. The facts are the same. We all live on the same Earth, in the same universe, with the same plants, animals, and fossils. You see, the argument is not about the facts. It's about how you interpret the facts. For example, fossils and stars exist in the present, but to understand where they came from, we have to develop beliefs about past events which won't be repeated for us to study today. So the debate isn't about the facts we see today, but the beliefs we use to interpret the facts. was no intelligence or purpose. There were only particles and impersonal laws of physics. These two things plus chance did all the creating. Without them, nothing was made that has been made. The particles combined to become complex living stuff through a process called evolution. Prune of humans, not having science to tell them what had happened, dreamed up a creator they called God. Even before Darwin published his Origin of the Species in 1859, evolutionists had spent millions of hours researching reasons to reject God as their creator. Evolution masquerades as science by using scientific terminology and teaching small, observable changes in an organism to prove that one type of creature has turned into a completely different type. Evolution is taught as fact in our public school textbooks throughout the world. We need to prepare our children to ask the right questions if they're going to understand what is being presented to them in schools, at the movies, on television, at national parks and museums. Creation research is beginning to make an impact thanks to the work of organizations such as Institute for Creation Research, Answers in Genesis, Apologetics Press, the Creation Research Society, and many others. The dedication of these organizations to further scientific research and education is tremendous. They merit our prayers, encouragement, and financial support. Here at Cornerstone Television, we believe if you are really seeking the truth about your origins, you need to examine the evidence that exists all around you. That's what this television series seeks to do, as we feature many dedicated scientists, researchers, and authors from around the world. Take the time to examine the evidence with us here on Origins. We trust that our efforts will be a blessing to you. Today's guest on Origins, Ralph Muncaster, is also the author of several books including Dismantling Evolution and Creation vs. Evolution. Book orders are being taken at 1714-628-8767. Ralph Muncaster is also the founder of Evidence of God Ministries and has written many books that help people with belief struggles. For more information about our guest, you can write to Evidence of God Ministries, PMB number 108, 2560 East Chapman Avenue, Orange, California, 92869, or visit their website at www.evidenceofgod.com. Hi, welcome back. I'm Don Chapman, and you're watching Origins, and we're having a great time today. And we've been talking about, you know, if we even assumed the impossible, which is the, the life of the first cell, that the transition seemed to make it impossible. Ralph, when we left, you were talking about uh, the order in Genesis being exactly the order that science says things would have had to happen, and you said the chances were one in four million that Moses, without divine revelation, would have been able to write them in that order. You know, one of the other things is that uh, not only does that life have to be there, but it has to be in a place that is, um, that's compatible to life. Yes. And we live in an earth that's compatible to the kind of life that's here. 
Talk about that. A it's more, more so than people can, can really imagine. And the first thing I'd like to address is people might say, well, wait a minute, I hear about this Big Bang that scientists talk about. Now, doesn't that imply some chaotic explosion that's unplanned? Well, the first thing I want to state is the Bible talked about the Big Bang long before any scientists do. And I think there are approximately eight references, which are in my book, that talk about God spreading out the heavens that is identical to the Big Bang. It also talks about the beginning of time and things like that. Now scientists uh, were very concerned when, when the information supported the Big Bang that everyone was going to run off to church. It was so much in favor of support of the Bible. Unfortunately, it was tagged with this name like a bang, like an explosion that sounds chaotic. Nothing could be further from the truth. When you analyze the facts, you find that this is a magnificently orchestrated symphony by God that prepared earth for mankind. For example, you find that there is the, the planet has, there are about 153 parameters of earth, any one of which a slight change would have made it, life impossible on this planet. Now we know some of the, the basics, things like the perfect size of the planet, the, the perfect distance from the sun, uh, the precise speed of rotation is important, the number of moons. If we had two moons, we would be in chaos. One is just right, the size of the moon. Uh, there, there are other factors, the amount, the, uh, the proportion of elements in the crust and in so many things. And I have, a, like I said, a list in the back of my book. But the bottom line is God created the planet perfect for mankind. So we're, we're getting to a point where we see very clearly that God made the heavens and the earth and he made the life that lived on them. That's the only way it fits together. Friends, I just want to say to you that if you have questions about uh, anything that you heard today about the whole business of transition and creation, but don't be afraid to write to me at Origin, CTV, Wall, PA, 15148, or there at the bottom of your screen, you see our, our website. You're welcome to go there, and if I can't answer your question, we'll find some folks like Ralph that can, and we'll get you some good answers. You know, I just want to remind you of something very basic as we leave our time together today, and that is, you know, it's God's view that He created you. And that ought to be your worldview, too. It's been great having you with me. I hope I'll see you next time. God bless you. watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 446 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program number 446, Cornerstone Television, Well, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.